I'm going to kick us off today. Thank you and welcome everyone who has signed up and joining us today. We are very excited and honored to kick off the second in a webinar series brought to you by UW Medicine, the Center for Women and Children and Right as Rain. Um, this today's program, as you know, by registering was let, uh, the second in our series, Let's Talk About the Vagina. Um, I'm very excited to hand this over to our talented team of experts um, who are going to lead us through conversation um, and actively engage with all of you who are uh, here live today. Few house cleaning items. Today's uh, webinar series is being recorded. Uh, we're going to share this out for people who were not able to join us live today um, and push this out probably uh, by early next week or end of this week. So uh, look forward to um, being able to see all of the information that you're going to be learning today. Secondly, this is a live conversation. We welcome you to submit uh, your questions that you will have throughout this program. At the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A tab. Please submit those. Again, um, we have an amazing uh, set of experts um, here today who will be trying to answer many of those conversations that are coming in and that have come in in advance of today's program. With that said, you've got a whole team of people behind the scenes, some of them, and you're seeing their names on your screen. And if you'd like to hide that, that view, go to the top of um, your screen. There's three dots on the right-hand side of your view. and uh, Just select to hide non-video uh, participants. So again, thank you for joining. Thank you for your interest. I'm excited to hand this over to Dr. Pauk to lead us in today's program. Hello everyone and thank you for being here and welcome to the Let's Talk About the Vagina and also the Vulva. Um, this webinar will review vulva vaginal health and concerns that can affect people with vaginas throughout their lives. We have received all your wonderful questions um, from people of all ages, cover the whole lifespan, and our expert panelists are excited to answer all of your questions. And with that in mind, I'm going to introduce each one of them. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Emma Stevens. She grew up in Kirkland and is a proud Lake Washington High School kangaroo gra graduate. Um, she did her training in upstate New York and is currently um, faculty and a general OBGYN at Northwest Hospital. Our second panelist um, is Tina Allen. She has been a physical therapist for 28 years and specializes in treating pelvic health. Um, she practices at the University of Washington Medical Center in the urology and urogynecology clinics. She also teaches rehab providers throughout the United States about how to care for clients with public health conditions. And finally, Dr. Anna Kirby was born and raised in Seattle. She is a urogynecology specialist at the University of Washington with expertise in pelvic floor disorders, pelvic organ prolapse, and urinary incontinence. They're all experts in their field and we are so lucky to have them all here. Thank you. And I'm gonna start the presentation now with Dr. Stevens. Hey, hi everyone. Welcome to um, this seminar. And if we can go to the next slide. That's all our names. So um, I was tasked to uh, speak about vaginal health and the way we're kind of going to present this is kind of the life cycle of the vagina. Um, so I might be talking about things that might be ailments for people that are younger, premenopausal, um, and that might be an issue with their vagina or vulva. So one thing that I get asked a lot in my office is, um, is this normal? And I have a lot of patients just not knowing uh, what they're experiencing in their own lives, if that is something that they should be concerned with or if it's a normal variant. Um, as you can see for this meme, um, it kind of cor correlates with the first um, quote, my boyfriend told me to drink pineapple juice. And that was an aid to have her taste better during oral sex. Um, and having that conversation about proper vaginal hygiene and lifestyle choices that could aid in a, in a healthy vagina um, to kind of kick things off with, of talking about um, the acidity or the pH level of the vagina, which is very important to make sure that the bacteria that's supposed to be there is in the right ecosystem. Um, and when it's not in having the right ecosystem in the vagina, we end up with ailments like having itchiness or ending up with bacterial vaginosis 
or other ailments that could be concerning and also with the use of the vagina, sexual use with a partner or without, um, could make, di make discomfort occur. So to talk about um, kind of normal vaginal health and things that we can do in our lifestyle um, is things to maintain that pH of the vagina. So one thing that lives in the vagina is lactobacillus. Lactobacillus um, is used for, um, sorry, we're like kind of switching some slides, um, is uh, used to create acid in your vagina. And it's really important to support that. Um, one question that we got before this um, panel has started was asking about probiotics and the use of probiotics in order to better vaginal health. Now, studies have shown both ways that vaginal health can be improved with consuming probiotics or even putting suppositories of probiotics, but there's other studies that say that it doesn't help. But one thing that we do see across the board of when consuming things that can promote better gut health will then end up promoting better lactobacillus. Therefore, having a more acidic vagina, which is a more healthy vagina. Um, one thing that I would say, maybe don't go with what they suggest in this meme in consuming a bunch of pineapple or pineapple juice is that really high levels of sugar in your diet might kind of precipitate having these issues and ailments of the vagina particularly ending up with an uh, infection, especially if there's a little bit of insulin insensitivity, a lot of that sugar can end up in the urine and then being coming in contact with the vulva turns into a yeast infection, which no one enjoys. The next comment that I had probably three weeks ago or so is that I had a patient ask me about what is normal discharge and the person she was talking to um, asked for a shot of her underwear in order to prove that she was making adequate discharge or prove that she was aroused. Um, and that kind of prompted a whole conversation about what's normal, what's not normal for discharge. Generally speaking, in the vagina, we should have clear to white discharge, varying in thickness, and should be odorless. That is with a caveat. Obviously, the vulva has hair, has sweat, has bacteria in it. So when that's all together, that can cause body odor. So there might be some body odor with that discharge, but not necessarily something that's foul smelling. And the amount of discharge someone makes can really vary according to where they are in the cycle or to the individual. So maybe one person, he got a shot of their underwear and it might look different from the next person that he might ask for a shot from. And one trick, uh, one trick for this old dog that I heard from this uh, patient was that she put a squirt of lotion on her underwear and just sent a picture of clean underwear to this guy. Um, next comment was uh, having patients talk about how they're told by others that lubrication, um, is not needed because they're too young for it, or that sex should feel a certain way because they're young and, and it should be always enjoyable. And that can really vary with different women and how much discharge and how much lubrication they naturally make. And I always tell my patients that there's no sure way to know if it's enough. We know it's enough if you're comfortable with whatever you're doing. So whether it's intercourse or outer course or sharing this experience with a partner, male or female, or someone who does not identify as either, um, what, as long as what you're doing is enjoyable and not painful and not uncomfortable, then that would be enough lubrication. Now, there was a question um, prior to this panel about lubrication, when to use it, when is best to use different types. Generally, there's three different types of lubrication, water-based, oil-based, and silicone-based. So water-based and oil-based are really helpful for the use uh, with a lot of our sex toys. Sex toys, a lot of them are silicone-based and we don't want to use silicone-based lubricant on silicone-based toys, which makes it break down. Um, this, the, in this question, they ask for particular brands and I'm not supposed to like promote certain ones, but um, in terms of popularity in um, Astroglide, their oil type of lubrication is very popular. Um, Lube Life has a very good water-based uh, lubricant. And my personal favorite of the silicones is actually Uber Lube. And that can be used for as a lubricant, 
as an anti-chafing. And if you notice, I don't have any flyaways right now. It's because I put it in my hair this morning because it can smooth down your hair as well. We can go to the next slide. So a lot of times when we're faced with all these questions of, is this normal, is this not normal? And you might not be able to have direct um, access to a gynecologist to ask about this, you look on the internet. And some of the posts that I read um, on Reddit and Instagram, and unfortunately TikTok doesn't have any posts directly about the vagina because it was deemed inappropriate, um, is a comment by one user, an older woman, who talked about, please tell teenage girls in your life that vaginas are in the natural state are not dirty. I have a lot of young women coming in and saying that, how do I get my vagina clean? How is it supposed to be clean? I feel like it's dirty. It doesn't smell right. It should smell like X, Y, or Z. But I always say a vagina is supposed to smell like a vagina. A vagina isn't flowers. It isn't fruit. It isn't coconut. It's not going to smell like those things. Um, and we want to stay away from those really scented soaps or scented detergents or sprays or, 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 fragrances to try to make your vulva and vagina smell like something it is not because it can cause irritation. The biggest reason why we have people come into our office as gynecologists is because they have some, some sort of irritation of their vulva or their vagina. Um, and we don't want to precipitate that by using these products. So generally for hygiene uh, purposes, um, I always suggest really clean hand and use, if you need to use soap, use really mild soap and wash the vulva. Nothing needs to go inside the vagina. I say stay away from washcloths that you would use on the rest of your body because that might have the body wash that you were using somewhere else. It might carry bacteria if you're not replacing it every day. And that is not healthy for the vulva. Um, and then the next comment talking about how a dry and unprepared vagina should be considered as a considered as the same as a flaccid penis. And that goes into use of lubrication, um, kind of arousal. And also there was a question about sexual dysfunction in terms of the, of the vagina. Now with sexual dysfunction, it can happen be for a myriad of reasons, and it's not directly a vaginal issue, but you know, your vagina is involved. And it could be a psychiatric issue, it could be relations issue, um, it could be stress, it could be poor diet, it could be depression, any of those things can affect um, arousal. But things to help would be um, kind of exploring and increasing communication with a partner, and also having help help with lubrication, help with sex toys, help with, um, with counseling to improve these symptoms and also help with pelvic floor physical therapy if we find that that might be an issue what's causing vaginal discomfort during intercourse um, or any sort of penetration. Um, and then on Instagram, hashtag vagina, since it was just Valentine's weekend, there was a lot of posts about happy Vagentine's day. Um, and talking about self-pleasure and things like that, which I briefly touched upon with the use of lubrications. And as I said before, unfortunately, TikTok doesn't have much for our Gen Zers um, to give information about normal, healthy vaginal health. But I would say on TikTok, there's a lot of OBGYNs that give a lot of really good information. So if you guys are on TikTok, you can look them up on uh, GYN Health. I think it's a hashtag GYN Health. We can go to the next one. So I do have a case study to kind of talk about one issue or a, a myriad of issues with a particular patient that might be um, an issue that other people, you know, kind of correspond with. A 31-year-old woman who's postpartum from essentially a normal vaginal delivery having different complaints. And so many times I have heard, no one told me about this. No one prepared me for what was going to happen to my vagina after I had this baby. And one of those complaints is having bleeding and then it stopped and then having this funky discharge and that's concerning to them. Um, incontinence and having issues with holding their urine afterwards. Um, having stitches placed and not knowing the importance of those stitches. Um, having your vagina feel differently in the postpartum state, feeling tight and itchy. And also having sex feel a little bit different. We can go on to the next one. 
So to talk about the postpartum vagina, one thing that unfortunately I have to tell people is that your vagina is not going to be the same after you're done having a baby. Um, it's going to be really close, but not exactly the same. Um, but no one's really going to be able to tell other than people like me who look at vaginas all the time. Um, eventually, as the healing process goes on, the rugae or the ridges of the vagina kind of reappear, um, if you will, over the course of about a month. And one thing that speaks to what those stitches are doing is that the pelvic floor could have been damaged with the delivery of the baby. And the stitches can help bring together muscles. Also, pelvic floor health, health and exercises, um, really important to be directed by someone who knows what they're doing, um, can help, um, help that girdle rebuild itself after giving birth. And then also talking about the bleeding and abnormal bleeding um, that one might think they're having after having a child of when that placenta comes off, it's not just, hey, it's healed immediately. That placenta comes off and it leaves kind of a wound and then it kind of makes a scab. And as we know from when we picked scabs when we were little, underneath that crustiness was not something pristine and perfect skin. It was kind of gooey and icky. And that's what happens after your placenta comes off and as that site starts to heal itself. And then finally, speaking about the bladder, which also will be spoken about several times over during this, this talk, is that after having a baby, your bladder can hold a lot of urine. And that uh, ability to hold a lot of urine allows that uh, muscle pouch, if you will, of the bladder to be weakened and just kind of let go of urine. And that's not a normal thing otherwise, but immediately postpartum that can happen and the control of the bladder should get better over time. And I would recommend that if anyone is experiencing this and it's not getting better over time, visiting someone like Tina who can help with um, strengthening the pelvic floor and control um, is a great first step. But of course, if if this is something that's a little bit more of a permanent issue, seeing someone like Dr. Kirby to help with these issues. Hi everyone, um, I'm gonna jump in next here and just tell you a little bit about Pelvic Health PT because most of my patients, the first time they come in to see me are really wondering, why am I here seeing a physical therapist? I'm here to talk about my my vulvar region. I'm here to talk about my private parts and I'm not sure what you can do. Well, as a physical therapist, I treat muscles and I teach people how to move better and how to use their muscles better. And I happen to, and people that do what I do as physical therapists, we specialize in the whole pelvic girdle and helping people learn how to use their muscles better. And so we look at those muscles and, and muscles surround your vagina and your urethra and your anus. So there's these three openings um, with the feminine genitalia that, there, there's muscles that are surrounding and there's any number of reasons those muscles may not be working as well. And we can help teach those, teach our, our clients that we see and teach you how to use your muscles better for better control and support or possibly learning how to loosen those muscles. We also teach people how to move and use their core better. Um, Inevitably, I see folks who have had their children 30 years ago or even 40 years ago, but they're still in some of the postures they maybe acquired while they were pregnant, where their, their back is more arched and their belly is more forward, where they made room for their children to grow inside their uterus, and then they've stayed in that position. But now maybe that's not helping them as well. So we teach folks how to move better also, and so it can be posture and positioning as as well as focused in on their pelvic floor muscle region. A lot of folks think about doing kegels, so I need to always strengthen these muscles. That's true. We may need to strengthen the, the muscles of the pelvic floor to help people feel supported um, after they've had a child and they need to, to make their muscles work a little bit better for them or if they have some urinary symptoms. 
but just as many people I see, I actually have to teach them how to let go or release or open those muscles a little bit more so that it functions better. Our pelvic floor muscles need to contract for continence and orgasm. And then our pelvic floor muscles, go ahead and go back that to that other slide. Thanks. Um, our muscles also need to relax for rest and to be able to go to the bathroom. And they need to bulge for babies and bowel movements, as well as the pelvic floor muscles need to support our core. So when you're seeing a pelvic health PT, we're gonna figure out what those muscles need and what your trunk needs to give you better support, um, whether that means strengthening and coordinating the muscles, or if that means releasing, opening, stretching those muscles. So folks who have pelvic pain often need to release their muscles and patients who are having or folks that are having urinary leakage, it could go either way. You might need to strengthen or coordinate the muscles or you might need to learn to release and move better and breathe better and not grip your pelvic floor so much. So just seeing this full gamut where it isn't, when we talk about the pelvic floor muscles, it's not all about kegels. It's not all about strengthening. We wanna look at both. And now we'll talk about that in the, in the next slide here where we talk about a client. So, a patient came in to see me, referred from their general physician, which is great, and they were having pain with insertion, um, with any kind of intimacy or touch to the pelvic floor region, and specifically at the vaginal canal. The patient was 45 years old and had pains with all attempts at insertions, and it's been worsening. And this has also kept the patient from doing their primary sport, which is cycling, and even clothing touching and sitting seemed to bother those tissues a lot for the patient, so much so that they were standing all the time. Some of you are probably saying, oh, I've experienced that, and realizing that what you could get help for that. So in the physical therapy eval, we, what we found were the muscles of the pelvic floor were really um, restricted. The, the pelvic floor region should be very um, mobile. It should have a lot of slide and glide to it. And then also, yes, it should be able to tighten and hold. Having our pelvic floor muscles be super tight and restricted doesn't help us be able to release those muscles to have urination, to, to allow for penetrative insertion, or to have bowel movements. So we want to make sure that that's, that's um, mobility is there of those tissues also. So on assessment, we found really tight muscles. Um, the patient told me that they had always, after they had their kids, they felt like there was always this pressure down in their pelvic floor region and that perineum region. They were afraid something was going to fall out. And so they just started holding. And this is where they took it too far and they made everything too tight. So now even sitting could hurt and clothing touching could hurt. So what we did in PT is we taught them how to release their muscles, how to relax their muscles and Everybody can try that here. While you're sitting here, think about actually sitting on the chair that you're in and think about where your pelvic floor muscles are. Are they between your two sit bones? So those bones that you sit on in your bum that you're sitting on, I want you to think about the area in between. Can you let it go just a little bit and let it rest on the chair? A lot of us walk around very perched and holding all the time and up and ready to go, especially with all the sitting at home we're doing right now. And if we just practice some of this breathing and releasing into the chair, that was that initial exercise for the patient. And when you're feeling some tightness, relearning that this muscle can actually release can be very helpful. We also taught them some stretches. So if you're familiar with yoga, there's two stretches that have been found to really help lengthen and open the pelvic floor, which includes a happy baby stretch and a child pose stretch. So if you're familiar with yoga, those can be very helpful. Um, and then doing some deep breathing can really help release and open those muscles. And so that's what the patient's home program was, was learning to let go, doing some general stretching, and focusing on actually releasing as they did the stretch. And then in coordination with that, we did some manual techniques, so some massage techniques to help the patient be aware of those muscles again. Because most of us, let's 
let's be honest, there's there's at least half the population that just never think about their their perineum or their private area that they're not realizing that there's muscles there. Most of us learned about these muscles. Um, we figured out how to use them back when we were getting potty trained between two and five sometime in there. Um, and, and then they just did their job. And then suddenly they're not doing them anymore. The muscles aren't working quite right. So if we can spend some time to focus to learn how to use them, that is, that's gonna be so helpful and be aware. With that then, the patient after about six sessions was able to return to having intimacy and they were actually able to get back on their bike and not feel more pain. Um, and they, in collaboration, I had them work with their OBGYN and talk about what could really help their tissues. This particular patient was able to start using some topical estrogen, which I know Dr. Kirby is going to address and talk a little bit about too. So that'll be coming up. And then I taught them about lubricant as Dr. Stevens talked about, where what they could use, and I had them use a water-based lubricant just to help things um, be more slide and glide to their tissues, which allowed them to have penetrative intercourse without as much pain. And as they weren't having pain with intimacy, they didn't need to use the lubricant as much. I always tell my patients, if I walked in and I was like, if somebody kind of always hit you in your arm, you would eventually, every time you saw that person, protect. And your muscles are doing that for them. And this particular patient, every time their partner was being a more amorous with them and they were afraid that it was going to try to progress to something that was painful, the patient would tight, muscles would tighten down. As we were able to replace those incidences of pain with, oh, this doesn't hurt as much. Oh, we can do this and it doesn't hurt and I don't have pain for days and I don't have any um, every repercussions from it. They needed less and less lubrication because they were able to develop their own. So realizing it's a journey and you're a whole human that we're working on as we work on everything to help people get back to intimacy without pain. Ms. Kirby, Dr. Kirby. Hello. Um, so my role, at least to start out until we get to the Q&A portion, is to answer the questions that were sent before we got together for this webinar about I'm 70 and I have a vagina, or I went through menopause, still have a vagina. Um, the, those are the types of, or I'm riding a bike and now it's getting tender or sore or bleeding. Um, those are the questions that I am going to at least superficially answer during this little tiny part of my talk and then can try to more specifically answer in the Q&A later. Um, I'm gonna do, address two topics um, via case study. So the first one is, a 70 year old patient who tells me that she has any of these things. She might have vaginal itching, burning or dryness or vulvar itching, burning or dryness. She also could have irritated bladder symptoms like urinary urgency or frequency or having to get up a lot at night to empty her bladder. Pain with intercourse that we've talked about a little bit from the perspective of postpartum and with pelvic floor spasm that Tina treats so well. Um, and then also if the, my patient is having recurrent urinary tract infections, it sounds like this is a lot of kind of um, diverse problems that can all happen to the pelvis, but the answer to all of them is the same, Dr. Pauk. All of these problems that my patient is having, if she's having one or all of them, most of them will get better if she uses a topical estrogen in the vagina. There can be other things going on too. The bladder can have other types of dysfunction. The muscles can um, not be functioning right. But, but almost every single person that I meet who has gone through menopause and has any of these pelvic floor problems, I recommend a topical estrogen. The lining of the vagina thins out with menopause the skin of the vulva thins out and becomes more irritated with menopause, and the lining of the bladder can also thin out. There are estrogen receptors in the bladder. So for any of these problems, although I'll have other suggestions as well, I will recommend that my patient uses a vaginal estrogen tablet, cream, or a ring. Next slide. 
But then what if my patient says, you know, I've, I've heard a lot about estrogen. I've heard about it in the news. I've had breast cancer. I've had a stroke. I've had a blood clot. I'm still smoking. Um, and I'm already on oral estrogen and it hasn't helped at all. My answer to this patient with any of these concerns is that most likely this patient can use a uh, vaginal estrogen. Next slide. So almost every single person that I meet can use a topical vaginal estrogen. The absorption into the bloodstream is so low that it can be combined with the um, systemic hormone replacement therapy, the patch or the pill that my patient's already taking. If my patient or her mother or her sister has a history of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, this patient can still use vaginal estrogen. It has been well documented to not increase the risk of recurrence, even in a cancer that we know um, responds to estrogen. So we have very reassuring studies. The one group of patients that, that there's a bit of a caveat are the patients who have had estrogen receptor breast, positive breast cancer and are still taking aromatase inhibitors to reduce their risk of recurrence. We don't have data one way or another, so this is very much a have the conversation with your doctor. Um, and I have patients who working with their oncologists have decided that whatever one of these pelvic disorders is problematic enough for them and affecting their quality of life enough that it's worth it, even without data to suggest that we know it's safe. Um, and then other patients can actually switch to tamoxifen from the aromatase inhibitor and then safely use vaginal estrogen. So even if you're in this very small group, um, it's still something to, to see me and see your oncologist about because it still could be considered. We also have great data that this very, very low dose of estrogen doesn't increase the risk of blood clots or strokes. Um, and if you're smoking for 8,000 other reasons, I would recommend that you continue to try to quit, but it does not mean that you can't use one of these low doses of estrogen. Next slide. These are the two committee opinions that I would refer you to if you have any concerns um, about using estrogen if you've had cancer or have had a blood clot. Um, it goes through all of the data, all of the numbers, um, and I find it very reassuring and I, I print these and hand these out all the time. Next slide. There are three different types of vaginal estrogen. A uh, ring that can go in the vagina for three months, a tablet or a cream, um, the two ways to decide which estrogen to use are either which one the insurance covers best, which is like a kind of an annoying insurance logistical answer. Um, they all work the same. So whichever one's cheapest is probably the best. Um, and then other than that, it's just patient preference. If it's less annoying to put a ring in and replace it every three months versus using something two nights a week. Next slide. Uh, a couple questions uh, in addition that aren't the, the big questions, like I've had a stroke or breast cancer, can I use this? Are questions like, what if I put the estrogen in at night and then want to have intercourse with my male sexual partner and it is such a low dose that it doesn't get into your, your bloodstream, it 100% will not affect him. Um, the other group of people that I um, didn't emphasize well enough are that it doesn't have to be menopause from age. This doesn't have to be just my 70 year old patient. This could be someone who, like Dr. Stevens was saying, um, right after having a baby, you can have kind of a relative hypoestrogenism, especially if you're breastfeeding and using a little bit of this estrogen just for a few months can be life changing. Um, if you're just starting to go through menopause, you can start it. Like I said, it's such a low dose, it just can't hurt. And also if you have menopause either from uh, chemotherapy, radiation, or having had your ovaries removed for some reason. The other thing that I wanna um, emphasize is, um, I think there's somebody in the um, questions who said, you know, I was prescribed Premarin to try to decrease my pain with sex. Will this help? And my answer is, yeah, I really, really think it is. Um, but it's taken, you know, months to years for the vagina and vulva to become in this state that it's in. It can take three months to get back to where it was. So give it that full three months before you decided if it before you decide if it helped or not. And then we can come and help you with the other um, problems involved as well. Uh, if it rocks your world after three months, stay on it. It only works as long as you're using it. Um, and then the same thing is, you know, if one of them is $300, which is a crime against um, 
well, female humanity, um, find out which one's the cheapest and we can switch to it. I think that's all I have for estrogen. Um, and then the, the last one I was going to talk about is just like Dr. Stevens was saying, a lot of things can happen um, after childbirth and pregnancy. And one of the more distressing things that I see in my clinic is when a patient suddenly finds something hanging out of her vagina. And so, um, and the problem is most of these patients haven't been told that that can happen. It's like, once it happens, they find out, but nobody's talking about it at the dinner parties or hikes or whatever they're going on. Um, so it is shocking for a lot of people when this happens. So I'm here to tell you that sometimes with age, connective tissue disorders and childbirth, the vagina or the uterus can actually hang outside your body. Next slide. Um, it is really common, even if the people that you're talking about with haven't mentioned it, 13% of people will have surgery for prolapse by the time they're 80, which is a lot of people. Um, it is not medically dangerous with very few exceptions. It's just really, really annoying. Um, and it's treatable. Next slide. Um, so, so first I say like, it's not actually falling out. Like it's not gonna fall out onto the floor. It's hanging out. Um, but I know that it's really, really uncomfortable. And so if she wants treatment for it, I can either put in a support device that you can see in the bottom left of this slide called a pessary, which is medical grade silicone that goes in and supports all the organs. And if that's not working or doesn't, have, doesn't appeal to this patient, I also have surgeries and I can put everything back up where it's supposed to be. Um, if it's mild and doesn't need any um, big interventions from me, or if there's anything else going on in the pelvis, which there usually is, um, I also recommend pelvic floor physical therapy for all of these patients. I think that is it for our, the presentations that we put together based on the questions that we received before this um, panel started. Um, and now I will turn it back to Dr. Pauk to guide us for the, for the last bit. Okay, thank you everybody. Give me one second to rearrange some stuff. Um, let's see. Okay, so I think our, um, our first question um, is from a patient who had hot flashes from age 45 and menopause began. And she has not let, that, that has not lessened on a hormone replacement therapy or a medicine that a group health doctor prescribes as a potential alternate approach? Is there anything else I can do that does not have potential cancer side effects? And I think that question would probably be a, a good one um, to talk about with a doctor in person, because I think there's a lot of nuance to um, find out what you've been already, what other medic what medications have you tried, how bothersome are your symptoms, um, possible other testing that might need to be done, but does it any, do any of the other panelists have any other thoughts on that? That's above me. Um, most of that is caused by a lack of estrogen, but if replacing the estrogen didn't fix it for you, it sounds a little bit more complicated than we can address today. Um, but we, there, are, there are experts in menopause in our area, um, and I would recommend them because they have their alternatives to estrogen, and I don't know what ones you've tried, um, but a lot of other treatments specifically for hot flashes um, that you should see an expert about. Oh, great, great. Um, and then um, next, is there an age when vaginal dryness sets in due to biologic causes? That, that could be me. Um, usually, it's, usually it's menopause and that's the main biologic cause. The average age in this country for menopause is 51, but it can start years before that. And the symptoms of menopause as we've talked about can go on for a decade or more. Um, there's no kind of magical age and it, everybody has their own biologic clock, but at, at any point that the periods start to become irregular, that's a point where you can come see one of us to see if hormone replacement therapy, either systemic is something that your body might want at that point um, or the vaginal estrogen that I was talking about. Okay. Um. And then um, the next one is actually, I think, good for Dr. Kirby as well. Um, I am postmenopausal and have pain during intercourse and dryness, but I cannot take estrogen because of a disease I have. I believe you, you addressed this a little bit in your slides, but what are alternatives that might help? Yeah, so, 
so like look really closely at these two committee opinions to make sure you really are someone who can't use a topical vaginal estrogen. It doesn't hardly get into the bloodstream at all and most people do great with it. Um, it might even be worth, even if you're concerned about it, a three month trial to see if the benefits are worth the risks for you personally. Um, that said, there are people for whom estrogen is not an option and there are other vaginal, um, vaginal hydrators things like a, one brand is Replens um, that I think you use every three days and it can replace the moisture in the vagina. If the bother is mostly with um, vaginal penetration, the lubricants that Dr. Stevens was talking about can play a role there. Um, and then this is a little bit out, outside um, like, I, I don't really know how much to get into this, but the other option for, for women who don't use vaginal estrogen is a kind of a new and evolving topic. It's the laser treatment for vaginal dryness. Um, it, it is still mostly recommended within clinical trials um, because we don't have good long-term data for it, but the 12-month data is good that, that a lot of patients are feeling much, much better after um, vaginal laser treatments. Um, and there are, although I don't offer it at the University of Washington, there are practitioners in the area who report really good success with vaginal laser surgery. It is still, I think, mostly cash only because the data is not there good enough for it to be covered by insurance. Um, but if you're at the point where none of these other things are helping, um, I would recommend talking to somebody about a vaginal laser surgery. All right. One other thing um, I do want to add to that um, also is that, um, is it, it's always good if you are taking vaginal estrogen and it's not improving the pain with sex or you continue to have itching and pain with sex, um, dryness, there are things that are not just due to atrophy, such as lichen sclerosis, other things that can also cause similar symptoms. So if you are, um, if you are taking vaginal estrogen, nothing seems to be getting better after you've given it the full three months of, of um, a three month trial, it can be good to be assessed um, again to make sure there's not something like an early lichen sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease or something else that is causing changes to the vagina or the vulva that is mimicking um, vaginal atrophy from, from low estrogen. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to the next question. Um, can you recommend a good book of vaginal physiology from Amy Outlin? Give us one to Tina, <laughs> or, sorry. Go for it, Tina. Oh. <laughs> um, the two that I offer, and then we'll have, um, Dr. Stevens, you'll add, please. But so the books that I recommend for patients are the V book um, is one, and then Come As You Are is another great book on arousal and anatomy of things. And then there's a book called The Anatomy of Arousal that's also very, um, it's great. It's more explicit, so being aware of that, but it's great. Those three books are the ones that I often recommend and have in my treatment room for patients to peruse while they're waiting for me. What would you add, Dr. Stevens? Um, it's not like really a physiology book, but the Vagina Bible, I suggest that too. Um, also, if anyone's a fan of Real Housewives, one of the Real Housewives, uh, Jackie Walters, she has a book. Um, it's called The Bee or The Queen Bee. Um, and she's a gynecologist that also talks about arousal and intimacy and things like that. Great. Thank you. Um, this next one I think would be good for Dr. Stevens. Do you have a suggestion for a vaginal area deodorant? Um, there's a lot that are coming out. Like if you're on Instagram, you probably got 10,000 ads for Loom. Um, that's one that I found that is pretty popular and does not have bad reactions to people's skin as much. So, um, it can either come in a stick form or more, uh, for the vulva, like a cream and you just put it on the outside. There's no deodorants to go inside the vagina. This is more of like the hair, um, bearing skin that makes secretions and makes sweat and things like that. Um, and that's where you would apply it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Um, this next one would be probably good for Tina Allen. Would you suggest PT for everyone after vaginal childbirth? <laughs> I would. Um, but I definitely the biggest, um, I think everyone could really be helpful in just helping getting an idea of how to get their body back. Um, and we don't just look at the pelvic floor, we also look at your core and help you build that back. So I think everyone could be really helped by postpartum visit with one of us pelvic health PTs 
absolutely without a doubt for any patient with grade three or four tear or assisted deliveries for sure. Um, but postpartum mamas, anytime from two to six weeks postpartum to 30 years, we can help you. Okay, 100% agree with that. Um, and then um, this is not a question, but a comment um, from a participant who found out that the estering price is greatly discounted if you go to the website and look for a coupon. So that's just a pro tip from one of our participants. Thank you very much. Um, and then here's one, um, what may cause regular spotting in between periods? And I think Dr. Stevens, as, as a generalist, that would probably be for so you. It can be for a lot of reasons. Um, so most of the time is if you're not on um, hormonal birth control, it's hard to know. It can be something inside the uterus that's causing kind of an irregularity of the lining that causes bleeding. Um, it could be irritation of the cervix or cervicitis that can cause bleeding. Um, it could be a lesion in the vagina. Um, if you are on um, hormone containing birth control, um, breakthrough bleeding might be a part of the side effect profile. So if you're on a really low estrogen combined contraceptive pill, that happens a lot. Or progesterone only pills that happens also with progesterone, progestin containing IUDs. Um, you can have spotting even if you're continuing to have periods. Great, thank you. Um, and then trying to get through as many as possible. Here's a quick one. When, when should someone get their first pap smear? Um, and I think there's a, the official answer now is we're now recommending primary HPV screening starting at age 25, but I think pap smear and pelvic exams are used a little bit interchangeably. And so if you have any concerns, whether it's pain with intercourse, abnormal discharge, you just wanna have a, a discussion with a gynecologist about something that you, you wanna ask Dr. Stevens some of those questions she tossed up there earlier, those are all reasons you can see a gynecologist maybe have a pelvic exam, maybe not have a pelvic exam. But um, the pap smear itself is a cervical cancer screen, and we generally start that at age 25. It feels very similar to just a regular pelvic exam. So you could definitely see a gynecologist before you have to start pap smears. I don't know and if you have to ask Dr. Stephen. Something to add to that 25, that's a recent change. If anybody else was like, hey, I just had a pap smear last year and I was 21. Why did they did that, do that to us? It's because our guidelines changed a little bit. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. It used to be 21, now it's 25. And you can always talk with your provider about your personal preferences as well in terms of screening. Okay, um, I have this one. Um, I have PCOS. Are there any vaginal issues I should be on the lookout to bring to, up with my OBGYN? So in terms of PCOS, um, usually the amount of estrogen is actually more than um, than generally people are exposed to. So you should not have symptoms like dryness or itchiness or things like that because of a lack of estrogen, even though um, ovulation may not be predictable and regular. Uh, so it really depends on how you feel. It's not something that's rooted in polycystic ovarian syndrome, but even with polycystic ovarian syndrome, any of these ailments like vaginosis or vaginitis or having um, reactions to the skin can occur and it's not like protective or anything. All right, um, this next one's for Dr. Kirby. Is there a typical age at which prolapse is most likely to occur and does it happen over time or something that feels more sudden and what percentage of patients opt for surgery versus other methods? It's like a little bit of a... A few questions in there. Yeah, well, many at once. So the question of the average age at which prolapse um, occurs, it can happen anywhere from the day after you have your baby until 105. Um, the average age um, of prolapse surgery in our clinical trials would probably give you a good sense of kind of when we usually see that. And there's kind of a a spike in people's like early 50s and then another one in uh, people's early 70s. The percent of my patients who opt for surgery versus expectant management or a pessary, I don't, I don't feel like I have a good answer for that. I can say that all comers in studies that we do, um, when someone is bothered enough by prolapse to get treatment, we can only find a pessary that works really well long term for about 50 to 60 percent of people and so that other 40 to 50 percent if they have bother will ultimately undergo surgery and then i'm gonna 
try to group a few of these together. There's several questions about bacterial vaginosis and recurrent bacterial vaginosis. Um, and then I want to, I'll give these to Dr. Stevens, but I also want to emphasize that that is definitely a challenging problem. Um, and it is often something that you want to work one-on-one -on -one with, with a provider for, and it could be a long period of time, as I'm sure those of you asking the questions um, know about. But um, basically, Dr. Stevens, any recommendations for treating recurrent bacterial vaginosis? It sounds like there's um, a couple of participants who've used even genetian violent and kind of on the boric acid treatment. Yeah, so it kind of goes back to making an ecosystem that is conducive of having the right bacteria in the right amount in the vagina. So as I talked about the lactobacillus and how it makes acid, if you have a more basic vagina, it's more prone to getting an infection. So anything that you can do lifestyle-wise to encourage that um, pH balance will be helpful. Um, usually our go-to is either clindamycin or metronidazole gels that go into the vagina. You could also take metronidazole, which is an antibi antibiotic, um, orally. Um, but with recurrence, we do not want to give a bunch of antibiotics all the time. So something that will lower the pH, such as boric acid suppositories, can be found to be helpful as well. And yeah, there are a few um, specialists who um, specialize in complex vaginitis, vulva vaginitis, that um, can be good to see. Any gynecologist should be able to talk to you about this, but um, there are definitely some specialists because it's a very complex um, issue and it's the source of many ongoing clinical trials, I will tell you that. Um, okay, there's a couple questions um, about waxing. Um, so if you wax or vulva and anus, do you have any precautions when doing this? And what is your opinion on waxing pubic hair, which I believe Dr. Kirby just answered, so. <laughs> Any, any waxing precautions? Don't burn yourself. <laughs> um, yeah, and if you are prone to ingrown hairs, talk to your esthetician or um, there are some products out there that can, you can apply afterwards to help reduce um, the risk of ingrown hairs afterwards. But if you are pr very prone to ingrown hairs, you might wanna talk about alternatives such as trimming. Um, and then this one is, for, we're almost up with our time, but for Tina Allen, my sister had a hysterectomy and I have untreated vaginismus, or I guess, or, or, or any of the panelists. Um, we are both in our 30s. Is topical estrogen recommended for either? And I believe there was also a question earlier that I can't find right now as to whether or not pelvic floor physical therapy would be recommended after a hysterectomy. I answered the hysterectomy one, uh, um, just answered it out that after hysterectomy in general, no, you don't need us. But if anything comes up where you're having any urinary symptoms or you're having pain with intercourse or difficulty with bowel movements, talk to your provider and then they're going to send you on to us for some support. But in general, after hysterectomy, people don't need us, but we're here if you do. And I, regarding estrogen, I'm going to pass that on to the docs. And then, and then the estrogen question is that the hysterectomy itself is just taking out the muscle. That's the uterus, maybe the fallopian tubes, maybe the cervix. In a young woman who still has ovaries, that shouldn't affect her hormone levels at all. And so somebody like that wouldn't need any estrogen. Um, the one, one group of people that I didn't talk about before is there is a very, very, very small number of people who get kind of a postmenopausal situation in the vulva and vagina after using hormonal contraception. It's really, really uncommon, um, but that's something that you would wanna see a doctor for evaluation because occasionally it can kind of reset the hormones in the body such that even if you stop taking the birth control pill, your hormones don't come back quite to normal. And so that would be a very, very small subset of people who are younger and not menopausal, who might benefit from topical hormones, particularly estrogen, but maybe even some of the other sex hormones. Yes, thank you, Dr. Kirby. Um, and then um, I, if you guys could direct your questions into the Q&A rather than into the chat, that is where I'm reading most of the questions off of. Um, but thank you for all the questions. Um, there's a, a question for, about how do you find a gynecologist who's an expert in menopause? And this question, this, uh, person lives in the Midwest. And I believe the National Association, or National, it's called NAMS, um, something, um, National Menopause, North American Menopause Society. I was like, I forgot what it's come for. They might have a list of providers on their website. Um, if you um, can look 
there. I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts or suggestions. I don't have other thoughts, but I just Googled it and they do have a list of practitioners. Great. Um, okay. Um, and then um, how it's been said that what you put into your body secretes out within 28 days later. So when you change to a better nutritional profile, should you be patient with your vaginal discharge? And I think Dr. Stevens, this is a good one for you with the pineapples. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, with the pineapples. Uh, I don't know about the 28 days exactly, but you know, any secretion that comes out, even other body odor will smell better if you have a better diet, hydrate well, a good diversity of macros. Right. Um, and are there, oh, Honeypot is a vaginal suppository. Do you guys have thoughts on this, these products? I think this is probably another good one for Dr. Stevens. I, I've never, I haven't actually heard of Honeypot. I haven't heard about it either, so I just Googled it. <laughs> um, so it looks like it's for vaginal hygiene of some sort. And I mean, if it's used to just clean things in the vagina, I would say no. But if you're using only honey pot products for like the outside, like I would say stay away from the wipes, but like just foaming wash, that's pH balance for just the vulva and it has no scent, then go for it. But anything that you put into the vagina or wipes are not necessary. And then um, are there specific precautions for intercourse and vaginal health while pregnant? Um, I think Dr. Stevens? Yeah. So. Um, not really. Like if it hurts, stop. Um, <laughs> a lot of times that really freaks people out is that uh, you can bleed a little bit, like having irritation of the cervix and having a little spotting. It's super common, but if it keeps coming out or if you're bleeding like a period, not normal, call your doctor immediately. Agree. And the only other thing I would add to that is that estrogen, very high estrogen levels of pregnancy can predispose you to yeast infections. Um, so they can be more common in pregnancy as well. Wonderful. I think we have time for one more question. One more question. Yep. Um, all right. Um, are some, this goes back to the bacterial vaginosis. Actually, here's a, um, a kind of, there's a question is, are some women more prone to BV? And I'm going to compound that one with, um, what should you use to clean up a menstrual cup? <laughs> I know those are two separate ones, but I'm going to put both in. <laughs> Um, yes, some women are more prone uh, to BV. It's not, you know, some older textbooks did make a correlation with race and, and possible socioeconomics. Um, and it could be partner based as well. Um, but all of the suggestions about how, it, how to improve vaginal health will help any, anybody in the population. So it's just not restricted to um, people who are less prone to getting BV. Um, cleaning your menstrual cup. I mean, just clean it. Don't use super scented, irritating soap that you're going to be putting that device back inside your vagina. Um, if you can do it with water and like hydrogen peroxide and then rinse it out, that would be perfect. Great. So thank you everybody for your questions. Um, if we didn't get to yours, I apologize. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Don. <laughs> awesome. And Dr. Park, if I could ask you to pull up that final slide, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you. This was an amazing conversation, um, super helpful. And thank you to everybody who registered uh, to today's program. Again, we're going to push this out. This is being recorded. We also want to tease up for you. Uh, this is a webinar series, again, brought to you by UW Medicine, the Center for Women and Children, and Right as Rain. And so next month, we're going to be talking about uh, women's uh, health and women's rights. Uh, so just want to make sure that everybody who's uh, here today is aware of that. It's going to take place Wednesday, March 31st. And again, thank you to all of our panelists for this amazing conversation. Uh, we really appreciate your time and hope everyone uh, got some of their questions and answers, uh, got questions and answers uh, uh, done for them. So thank you and have a great day.